This is MLW referee Doug Markham, and you're listening to Everything Pro Wrestling with Conrad Cushman. Once again, you already know what it is, and you already know where you have reached the number one up-and-coming professional wrestling combat sports podcast anywhere in the world. But I'm not going to do that today, man. I'm not going to do that today. It's Hubbard Wrestling Weekly, but it's also EPW, man. You know what I'm saying? This is the first ever collaboration between Hubbard Wrestling Weekly and Everything Pro Wrestling. Hit them with that tagline, brother. Folks, Everything Pro Wrestling is a show by the fans and for the fans. Yeah. And I am Conrad Cushman. Like we said, this is a tag team collaborative effort. The hot tag has been given, and we are ready to talk some pro wrestling. What's going on, Sean? Yes, good to be with you, my brother. Sean Hubbard in the building, Hubbard Wrestling Weekly. Conrad Cushman in the building, Everything Pro Wrestling. This is it. HWWEPW collabo. And uh, we got some major things on the horizon coming up September, but we're not going to talk about that right now. That was just a little teaser. But right now we're talking about Ric Flair. Woo, the nature boy, man. Almost uh, look like 12 years after the fact or 14 years after the fact of what we thought was his last match. Now we're really going to have his last match. Um, first of all, big shout out to Hoscrea.com where we love tech. Big shout out to... Uh, Kente Co- uh, Cones, um, Ice Cream, my homegirl, Ashley, doing big things. Big shout-out to my family, the whole nine yards. Um, Fight TV, man. Big shout-out to Joel and the Fight TV staff out there. They are going to be putting on what is one of the most anticipated um, shows in, in the history of Hubbard Wrestling Weekly, you know, our coverage. I, I want to say EPW's coverage as well. But I, I would arguably, arguably say also the history of Fight TV's coverage because even though they separated themselves as being one of the greatest streaming combat sports franchises in the world rick flair's final match rick flair's last match is is next level man so we're talking about july 31st 2022 rick flair's final 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 match and um right here we're going to do a little rick flair retrospective on 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 his career and everything that he's accomplished in the world of professional wrestling i'm really fired up about this man conrad tell me how just just your recollection of rick flair and and what you feel he means to the business before we get into his career retrospective i think overall rick flair is perceived this is going to be weird it's kind of like hip-hop in a way with pro wrestling i feel like wrestling is very territorial um something that may be liked by us we're we're both in the same state new york Mm -hmm. may not be liked by someone who's from florida or example i like jay-z jay-z great rapper to me enjoy his music (laughs) don't get us don't get a suit now i remember ddp and him had some beef over that (laughs) i'm I'm messing with you you know what no no i I always thought ddp was this but let me chill let me chill let me chill (laughs) listen i I just don't want to be in front of a judge explaining ourselves i feel you i feel you But New York, we all love Jay-Z for the most part, right? It's kind of a, okay, you probably like Jay-Z, Nas, whatever. Right. If you if you go to Florida and you say something bad about Trick Daddy, they'll think that man was Jay-Z. And I feel pro wrestling is the same way. Uh, New York cats, a lot of us were WWF, WWF. That's that's where this is at. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. And I feel that that other promotion, WCW, NWA, 
they were always about that Southern wrestling. And if Hogan was the face for New York, Ric Flair was the face for the South, That's in my fact. opinion. That's a fact. And I feel like he Hogan was the big time baby face that led the promotion and the NWA did it different. And Ric Flair was the bad guy that people wanted to be, which is kind of strange, too. And you see the influence that he has now. So uh, overall, I think Ric Flair will be seen as a wrestler's wrestler. He's the guy who, if I didn't want the pomp and circumstance that you would get from Hogan, he's the guy who you're going to watch go into the ring, have his match, and you're always going to be entertained by it. That's a, that's a sound assessment, man. That's a sound assessment. Um, I think Ric Flair is always going to go down in, in history as, as, as one of the greatest. Definitely a Mount Rushmore guy. You'll be hard-pressed to replace Ric Flair um, as a top four wrestler in the history of the business i mean you got your austin your rocks i always put jericho in the mix hogan but rick flair i think has a permanent place in um in the mount rushmore professional wrestling hbk but yeah again it's, it's just hard to replace rick flair so you know epw's in the building hww's in the building and we're talking about rick flair the arguably the greatest professional wrestler of all time we're going to take you on a little bit of a journey ladies and gentlemen big shout out to fight tv one more time as we prepare for july 31st 2022 um getting ready for rick flair's final match today is friday july 22nd you know about to watch those smackdown or smackdown after smackdown but um let's talk about rick flair and how he got started man you know back in the day first let me let me you know i'm, I'm all over the place so i'm excited bro do you remember awa i know you do yeah, yeah. AWA was uh, Minneapolis, right? That's that territory, fact. yeah. That's a fact. Vern Gagne was running the show down there. And, and Vern Gagne was really the first guy who really saw something spectacular in Ric Flair before even Ric Flair recognized it himself. A lot of people don't know this, but Ric Flair was a 300-pounder back in the day. Ric Flair looked like me back in the day. You know what I'm saying? Ric Flair was a chubby guy and um, powerlifting look, looking kind of guy. And um, he went to Vern Gagne's world-famous camp. Before there was a power plant in WCW, before there was NXT, there was Vern Gagne's camp in AWA in Minneapolis. So let's call a spade a spade. I mean, talk to me. I see you smiling. Talk to me. Uh, I don't know if it would be a camp, man. That was a barn. Mm, it was a mm, barn mm. they were wrestling in, bro. Like, yeah. that, that was some rough stuff, man. That sounded like... I don't know. I, I listened to Ricky Steamboat and all these guys talk about it, mm-hmm. and the stuff they were doing just doesn't sound humanly possible. It was there hardcore. Was no it was hardcore. I mean, carrying people upstairs on your back and 25 flights, and, you know, like you said, it was literally a barn with, like, a light over the ring. It, it, it was crazy. But Ric Flair quit wrestling a couple times. Vernon Gagne saw something in him. He continued pushing forward, ended up in the National Wrestling Alliance. I guess things didn't really work out with the AWA as he left there and ended up winning the United States Championship, the Mid-Atlantic TV Championship in the NWA. But something really tragic happened in 1975. Thank God it didn't end his life, but it could have. And it could have really been a story where we could have looked back on this on this day um, we probably wouldn't be seeing this day from a Ric Flair last match perspective, but there's a chance that Ric Flair may not have even been in our cognitive mindset as far as wrestling because he may not have been here. Thank God it didn't work out that way. Talk about 1975, um, October 4th, 1975. They, they had a, a, I think they were flying to matches in the Carolinas, if I'm not mistaken. And they were going to just do some shows over there. And Ric Flair was on a plane and the plane ended up crashing. And according to his side of the story, uh, the the it only had half the fuel. And when they went to go and hit the reserve, there was nothing there. If there's nothing there and there's no more fuel left, there was nothing else to do but hold your grip and just pray for the best. And yeah. the, the plane just went down and he said it took down a bunch of trees and I think afterwards, I, I can't remember all the injuries. I just remember that broken back in three places was that's right. uh, that's what right. he was given the diagnosis for. That's right. And there were some, some se- several other, you know, recognizable names on that same flight. You know, Johnny Valentine got paralyzed. You know, you had David David Crockett was actually on that on that flight as well. It was a crazy situation. Um, but by the grace of God, Ric Flair survived. It's crazy. I don't even understand how that happened, but... 
you know, I'm um, not going to preach to y'all, but God is good. So Ric Flair is still with us at this point, but he has a major rehab in front of him. We know that. But during his rehab, I guess he had an epiphany, brother. He had an epiphany and just came to the realization that, hey, you know what? I don't want to be uh, Rick Rhodes. I think he wanted to be a Rhodes at one point. He wanted to be, you know, uh, you know, part of the Rhodes family because he had a lot of respect for Ro the Rhodes family. But during his rehab, he had a little bit of an epiphany. Do you know what the epiphany was, Conrad? Yeah, he wanted to dye that hair blonde <laughs> and become the nature boy. Woo! Yeah, yeah, that was interesting um to see like some of his early like concept of what he was going to be with like the big glasses and he he was it was different it was very different i'll say that from uh what what people were probably used to seeing with him before he just looked like a, a guy that was just there yeah no doubt no doubt and, and also because of the rehab and stuff he ended up losing some well lost some weight because he was laying in the hospital bed but i guess when he wanted when he started getting back into um to training i guess he decided to train differently he wasn't going to be a bulky guy anymore he just wanted to be this cardiovascular uh you know machine being, yeah machine that's a really good thank you for that word by the way um he wanted to be this cardiovascular guy and he he created more of a slim profile for himself bl uh, bleached blonde the hair as you talked about and became the nature boy and the rest is really history can you give the people, and if not, I got you regardless, but can you give the people a little bit of history, not necessarily about his career, but just the character about Buddy Rogers, the guy who he kind of, the namesake of Ric Flair. Are you familiar with his work? Um, enough to speak about it, I guess. Uh, Buddy Rogers, definitely before our time. Oh, yeah. um, but Way before Buddy, our time. Buddy Rogers is looked at as like an ultimate legend in the business at that time. And Ric Flair wanted to basically become the second hand version of him. Mm -hmm. And back then you could pull that stuff off because wrestling was territorial. Not everybody had seen that act before. And Buddy Rogers was known for being up north with a lot of the, I believe it was the WWF at the time. Yes, sir. He was up there wrestling a lot and Ric Flair brought it to the South and people ate it up. It was exactly what the people were calling for. Somebody who was overly cocky, but Ric Flair, Buddy Rogers took it here. And I know without Buddy Rogers, Buddy Rogers crawled so Ric Flair could walk, but Ric Flair took it here because he made it more modern. That's he okay. made it He made it all about the cars, the women. I, I do whatever I want. I'm better than you because I got it like that and you don't. Yeah. And he would just rub were it you about to, Were you face. about to subconsciously say I'm better than you and you know it? Oh, no, no. But I do see a lot of similarities mm -hmm. in that young man that Ric Flair does. Uh, if you go watch that last promo he did, when he's yeah. in the corner, he always does something that reminds me of Ric Flair when he grabs both the ropes. And you know how they have, like, the camera shot position oh, to yeah. look right at you? Oh, he, yeah. he grabs both the ropes and he, like, slams them. And I'm like, this is like watching Flair on Nitro. It's and true. I think that every time. And Ricky Starks is another one who I see a lot of Ric Flair, how he holds the belt, how he conducts himself when he's speaking. And I'm like, they, these guys watch Ric Flair promos, oh, yeah. I can tell. The influence is crazy. Yeah, absolutely. So so Nature Boy Buddy Rogers was the original, and we give all props and respect to Buddy Rogers and his legacy. Ric Flair did take it to another level. It's just plain and simple. There's no knock on Buddy Rogers. He's a legend, Hall of Fame talent, did amazing in his time. But Ric Flair did take it to another level. So Ric Flair kind of recreates himself. He takes this opportunity. Literally, you know, could have died on that plane. So almost kind of like a rebirth kind of a situation and just completely reimagines himself and his character. He goes through the NWA circuit, you know, becomes, like I said, the Mid-Atlantic World, the Mid-Atlantic champion, TV champion, the United States champion. He was a Mid-Atlantic tag team champion as well. And um, then the time comes. I mean, Ric Flair gained enough momentum where he eventually got a shot at the NWA World Heavyweight Championship in, in September of 1981 against the legendary Dusty Rhodes, and he wins the title. September if you will. One, yes, right, if you will. In September 81, he becomes the world champion for the first time. Did you hear, however, Conrad, like, he wasn't really enthralled with that championship run, though. He really felt like it was kind of, like, lost in the shuffle. It, it was weird, like, going back, and I, I think – I watched the uh, 30 for 30 
uh, beforehand, before we spoke about this, to try to catch up on everything. And I just remember seeing that suplex, and it looked kind of like, what? Like, it looked like an accident like he won versus him getting, like, this strong victory. Like, yeah, he beat him. This was a great job. I feel like that came later in, like, I, was it Starcade 83? Starcade that right year? That's that's the one where I felt like they solidified him more so. 100%, 1,000%. Let me tell you something, man. Like, for me, again, before our time, it's but – I watched that match, obviously, on tape or, you know, the network, whatever you want to call it. And for me, a flair for the gold, Star K83, is when Ric Flair arrived. You know what I'm saying? He would lose the title uh, that he won from Dusty Rhodes, and eventually he would face Harley Race, Star K83, Thanksgiving night, 1983. And it was in a steel cage. And it's funny. I mean, we're going to talk about this a little bit, but just kind of sidetrack a little bit. Some of Ric Flair's greatest championship wins, as much as he's considered the greatest heel in the history of the business, in my mind, if you think about race in 83, Vader in 93, like a lot of Ric Flair's most classic wins as a world champion were as a face. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah. See, when I think of Flair, I always think of him as the heel yeah. Because I think that's where he excelled. But I think the chase for him always mattered. Like sometimes him being the, you don't have what it takes anymore, old man. You've talked mm-hmm. about having all this and you're not going to have it anymore. Right. But that to me fuels the persona of Ric Flair. Right. Of, oh, I've got to have it. I've got to be the man. And, th- and that's where the whole phrase comes from. To be the man, you got to beat the man. And it's 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 a beautiful thing. I think it just enhances his character overall. Like when you just put that together, it was like a puzzle piece just clicked for me and it just fit right in exactly how it's supposed to go down. And um, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Babyface title runs for him have been pretty good. Even the intercontinental title, like he's, he had some good runs. It was, it was, it was. And we're going to go all the way through um, his return to WCW in 93, 94. Um, and then we're going to stop and we'll touch base about other things later. But Let's get, like, Thanksgiving night, 1983. What do you remember? Obviously, neither one of us were alive, but um, I know you've done your research. You're on top of your game. Starcade 83 was a huge night for Ric Flair. His second world title, but probably his, his more significant one out of the first two. Talk about Harley Race. Talk about how Ric Flair was kind of the underdog in that match. So, for me... I remember King Harley Race, oh, yeah. and maybe oh, you're the same. Yeah. So I don't remember Harley Race being like the the BA World I never, Champion. I never saw Harley Race wrestle live when he was at his best. Same. I never saw it live, but we're historians. We go back. We check out everything. Harley Race seems like he was one of the toughest people that you would ever want to meet, and you mm-hmm. don't want to mess with Harley Race. Oh, yes. Um, he had loads of credibility, and I think that's what helped Ric Flair in that situation. Like I said, with Dusty, the first one, I feel like it was a fluke. And you know what I'm talking about. When you see it in WWE, some championship wins feel like flukes. Uh, a great example for today's fans would be The Miz. When The Miz won the world title the second time, we all knew he was doomed. I We knew, okay, you're going to give it to him, but this ain't going to last too long. Exactly. The countdown was hit as soon as he won it. We were like, yeah. Title. Exactly. Yeah, and that's probably how people felt about Flair, but this one was different. You were going to be in what was the NWA's version of WrestleMania. You're in the biggest match, and back in the day, I know it doesn't feel like this today, Just tr- you have to trust the old heads a little bit on yeah, some of this us, stuff. Trust us, trust us. Steel cage matches were nothing to be played with. Like, that was a, oh, it's about to go down stipulation. And when it came to this, they gave Ric Flair the ball. And they were like, here, they'd really take it and run with it. Because Harley Race wasn't going to be around too much longer after this from injuries. And he was going to start trying to take it easy. Eventually, your body breaks down from doing this in the ring. Ric Flair was the younger guy. Let him let him take over. It's it's his world. And once they gave it to Flair, Flair kept a grip and a clutch on it. And Ric Flair is one of the reasons why that company stayed around as long as it did. And I'm sure we're going to get into why throughout uh, this series that we're doing on this, this two-parter. Right. But definitely, definitely well worth it to uh, see how Ric Flair ended up carrying this company after this reign that he got in 83. 
literally on his back, man, on his back. And and it was something that was really cool to look back on. Obviously, neither one of us were even thoughts at that point. But like you said, as historians, we look back and we see the, the spectacle that was put on. Even like the spectacle before the spectacle, before wrestling was a spectacle, when it was still somewhat dimly lit arenas and still kind of minimal lighting and the fireworks were just sparklers instead of these massive pyro shows that we see now. But you knew that when Ric Flair walked down the aisle in that powder blue robe, that that was going to be a big night. And you knew that when Harley Race went down to the, the ring in that red and blue robe, you know, that old school swag that he had, no nonsense with the belt under the robe because he wasn't even like, people didn't even show off like that. It, that Ric Flair started to show off stuff, but Harley Race was old school, seven times world champion. You knew that was going to be a big night. You know, looking back on it 20, 30, 40 years later, you still look back on it and like, wow, like that, I wish I had been alive to witness this live. I wish I was alive to have witnessed, exactly. I wish I was alive to have witnessed Ali versus Frazier in 1970, like a full, like two decades before I was born. But like, I wish I was alive. I wish I was, you know, conscious, you know, I was one year old. I wish I was conscious for WrestleMania three. You know, I, I, you know, I would, cause these moments stand the test of time. So, you know, it was really a cool thing to look back on, but this is also the time where Ric Flair, when Ric Flair became world champion, like we just talked about, he became, you know, he was a big face in that match. Um, Holly Race to his graciousness, put him over the, the torch had been passed, but then Ric Flair got into some things, man. And Ric Flair started becoming the Ric Flair that we know. And he surrounded himself with some friends, storyline cousins, but definitely some friends. And he he started he started doing some things in in a team effort. He kind of put this fortress, this 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 guardianship around himself to be further uh, secure with his championship. Um, talk about that little squad that he put together, Conrad, because. Uh, after Ric Flair won the title, he wasn't rolling solo anymore. Yeah, it it came from a promo, I believe, from Double A. Arn Anderson was the one who said it, and um, I can't remember who it was against, but they had mentioned uh, the Bible in it, mm-hmm. and he and Arn Anderson said, "You know, when fear comes down, when you're seeing fire, and you're gonna see." The four horsemen, or he said the horsemen of the apocalypse oh, running right. running around. And double A Iron Anderson was part of probably one of the greatest. Some people still say the greatest wrestling faction to ever be created. It's hard Some to say argue. stable. It is. It's it's a great group, man. Like anybody who's who has been in the four horsemen. Have there been people who who didn't fit? Hundred percent. But you don't get better than the group known as the four horsemen and this that's up on the screen right now for those watching on video this isn't even the original incarnation it's not but, it's crazy but this is flair's favorite version of them mm-hmm. and uh i i think i may have to agree it's definitely one of my favorite versions of the horsemen as well i loved that version i liked the lex luger version i liked the Ole anderson version um I wish that we had, so we're going to talk a lot about more about this guy in a minute. I wish that Sting, Sting's version of the Horseman had lasted, but it just, it wasn't meant to last. That's the problem. It wasn't meant to last. It was all part of a storyline, but. Because who was the four when it was uh, Sting? When it was Sting, you had Ole as the advisor. He was JJ. Yep. Then you had Arn and you had Flair. And if I'm not mistaken. No, no, I think that's what it was. No, maybe it, maybe I'm wrong. I think it was only Arn, Sting, Sid, and Sid. Yes, and Sid. There you go. Now that I mean, that's funky, bro. That's funky. That that really could have been something. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty. That Sid. sounds pretty freaking good to me. But it didn't work out that way. It was all, uh, it was all storyline purpose to get Sting in so they can kick him out. But we'll talk about that in a minute. So, you got the Horseman. They quickly, quickly, my brother, become the most influential stable in all the professional wrestling. I mean, almost overnight. Yeah. Um, the next have, week, they said they saw people in suits doing this, like in the crowd. Nuts. 
it was like right away. It was similar to the younger fans when Austin said, talk about 316, and the very next night on Raw, you saw 316 signs. Same deal, okay? The Horsemen are together. The Horsemen have collaborated to be, to build up this, this tremendous stable. The original incarnation were the Anderson brothers, along with Tully and Flair. JJ was the advisor. Tully was the world television champion. Arn and Early Ole were the world tag team champions. I think they also were the United States tag team champions. I mean, Flair was the world champion, had a stranglehold on that title, right? He had lost it here and there. He lost it in 87 to Ronnie Garvin just to lose it back. You know, he ended up losing it right back at Starcade. I think that was just to add a little bit of sizzle to the stake of 87's Starcade because 87 Starcade went head-to-head -head with WWE Survivor Series. So you know what? They had Flair lose the title to Garvin a couple months earlier so they can, you know, pretty much promote this a million dollar challenge for Flair to win it back at 87. Smart business, smart business. Right. Um, but this is where I want to tag you back in. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat is on coming on the heels of what I'd say outside of being world champion was the biggest match of his career, which is WrestleMania three against Savage. Um, you know, 93,173 people, Pontiac, Michigan, stole the show. Uh, from Hogan and Andre, it, it is, it's a fact. I have respect for Hogan as a wrestler, a wrestler, as a persona. I have respect for Hogan. I'll leave it at that. Um, infinite respect for Andre the Giant, God rest his soul. But let's call it spade a spade. They stole the show. Savage and Steamboat stole the show and made Steamboat a household name, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think it was the work that they both put in. I think they both had the hunger to do something more. And uh, yeah, they they crushed it that night at WrestleMania three. I can't I can't say anything bad about either man in ring performance exactly. that night. Exactly. Now Steamboat ends up having some issues. I don't know if he wanted some time off. Whatever the case may have been, which led to I guess we can agree was a premature losing of the Intercontinental Championship. Now we all know history shows that Honky Tonk Man became arguably the greatest Intercontinental Champion of all time. Arguably the great, definitely the greatest intercontinental champion of all time as we talk about time duration. Facts. There's no argument there. But as far I mean, clearly I'm not talking in ring work. I'm not, but, I, but, I, I, th I think it hits me a little harder because I know what happened in my hometown. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry, yes. I'm sorry Ricky. I wouldn't have did that. Right. I wouldn't exactly. have did that. I feel you, bro. But yeah, from time. Okay. So history will show us that. But it may not have ever happened had Ricky Steamboat not made the request for time off or whatever the case may be. That misstanding, we can't go back and change time. Ricky Steamboat never wins back the IC belt. He's eliminated in the first round of the 88 uh, WrestleMania Four Championship Tournament. Ricky Steamboat's almost lost in the shuffle and ends up departing WWE to go back to WCW or the NWA. Talk about Ricky Steamboat's return and talk about the trilogy between he and Ric Flair. Yeah, that is some of the best professional wrestling you will ever see. Ric Flair and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat are absolute, like, phenoms in the ring. Um, the chemistry is something that I will put as off the chain. It was similar to Macho Man. Like, I don't know how Steamboat knew, but it felt like he could read people's minds or their eyes or what they were thinking i don't know how to describe it bro like yes. there was there was like this connection and chemistry where it was like okay um we're gonna do this 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 and this and he I said agree. they would barely speak and they would just be like off the ropes boom duck the clothesline yep okay back body drop bam how did they do all those things and not really uh know anything absolutely. you know absolutely it's crazy i i just i don't know it was beautiful those matches are just so great. Like I remember, so we're we're a little bit. I would still say I was pretty young at the time. Do you remember watching any of those live? No. See, I remember seeing them on like those highlight tapes. Like let's say WCW was delayed on that night, okay. they would show like Steamboat and Flair, and I'm like, yo, this match is amazing, bro. Yeah. I'm like, this is really good. I'm like, they should do this again. They should run this back, and it and, just worked. And it was a trilogy. It was a trilogy. They fought three times. Yeah. And I know Steamboat, I mean, they fought thousands of times, but I'm talking about in this particular instance, they they um, they faced each other three times in a row. 
Steamboat ended up winning the title from Flair, successfully defending at Clash of the Champions, and then they build. Um, they built. Hold on one second. Yeah, they 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 build it up to. Uh, they I, they did a great build. Don't get me wrong with it. They they just I don't know, man. It, whatever you like in pro wrestling, whether it's the the storytelling, whether it's um, whatever you want or need from it. Yeah. Ricky Steamboat and Ric Flair had it for you. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, the story was great. It, so here's the parallels. Ric Flair is this rich, cocky jerk. He's the dude who's the boss at your job that you just hate. He's right. got all the bread. He's got all the money. He's not a family man. And then you got Ricky Steamboat. He's the dude who works hard every day. He looks good. Why can't this guy get the shot? And that's the story they told, like, that's behind bad. it. And it just worked, bro. It just worked. And with Steamboat being the high flyer, Flair being the seller, everything just flowed. Like, I could talk about this all day. No, all day. Right. It was just one of those things. Like, they put together these three matches. Like I said, Flair, Flair lost the first one. Um, Flair lost the first one. Ended up losing the second one. And then they build the third one. As almost like, you know, we know this now as grown men it was BS, but it was Ric Flair's last opportunity. You know, like, this is it. Ric Flair, Rick, Ricky Steamboat said, hey, listen, in a pre-match interview, super dope. He's like, Flair, I've given you a shot before. I'm giving you another shot now. I've already uh, given you the obligated customary rematch. If you lose tonight, I'm moving on. Like, almost dismissing Ric Flair, like, Ricky Steamboat is telling the world, like, you know what I'm saying, bro? Like, he's telling the world, like, if you don't get it done, he's talking to Ric Flair. Ricky Steamboat, now, Ricky Steamboat, a Hall of Famer in his own right, but Ric Flair historically runs circles around, around Ricky Steamboat from a historical standpoint. Ricky Steamboat's looking in the camera and telling Ric Flair, hey, bro, <laughs> you don't get it done this time, you're out. Like, he's, he's talking to Ric Flair. Absolutely. I, I respect it, Ricky. But um yeah. And I believe didn't Flair turn babyface after the last match yeah, too? Like he turned babyface as soon as the, the, the referee counted three. Yes. Literally. Lo Lovey went to shake his hand, give him the hug, because he knew those matches were fire. They were they were bangers, certified bangers every single time. And what I loved the most though was Terry Funk after putting that beat down on Rick oh, Flair. My God. My God. But to your point, I'm so glad you brought that up. It was like on a dime, on a dime, Ric Flair goes from heel to baby face and instantaneously into this, I wouldn't call it epic, but really good feud with Terry Funk. Because that was, it turned into Terry Funk's last chance, kind of, was, was the story for him. Was. That was kind of his swan song as it related to being a top notch guy. Um, so, you know, you move forward with that. Ric Flair obviously would go on to successfully defend against Funk. And we're going into the early 90s now. Yeah, so we're talking about end of 1989 going into 1990. And then from, from there, you got a situation, bro, where Ric Flair is arguably going to go into his greatest rivalry of his career. You know, Ric Flair, we, you know, he, we talked about Harley Race. We talked about Ricky Steamboat. Those are very good candidates to go down as Ric Flair. That would be a pretty good DVD, Ric Flair's Greatest Rivals, just a little FYI. Anyway, um, if, if, if anybody does that, they owe us. They owe us money, residuals. But, um, yeah, I'm thinking about thinking about Ric Flair's Greatest Rivals. You have to say Sting. Let's just get into it. Ric Flair and Sting, um, he made Sting. Earlier in 1988, World TV, he was a world TV champion. He fought Flair to a 45-minute draw on the night of WrestleMania 4 when they put up the clash against WrestleMania head-to-head. -head. And, you know, two years later, almost two years later, Sting is now getting ready for his first chance to be the man. Unfortunately, it gets derailed a little bit earlier in the year because they were going to face each other in February of 1990. But Sting climbing the cage, you know, a little bit of a run-in, jumps off the cage, chasing Flair down the aisle. He tears up his knee. So now it's like, what the heck are we going to do? But I'll tell you one thing. Ric Flair really loves Sting. And Ric Flair went to the powers that be and said, 
I, I'll float this title around. You know, we'll do what we have to do to get enough time for Sting to come back. But I'm dropping this title to Sting because he deserves it. So that leads us to the Great American Bash, 1990. Please tell the people what you remember about that. I remember that Sting attire like it was yesterday. The uh, face paint, red, white, and blue. Uh, Sting Sting was like the hero for WCW. He was their version, I guess you could say, of like The Undertaker. That's how I always felt. Like he was the franchise. He was the guy who you were like, he's not going anywhere. This is our guy. We will pay for him. We will do whatever we have to do to keep Sting around. Yep. And Sting was that boy for them. And uh, in my opinion... Rick Flair, like you said, did a masterful job of putting Sting over. Uh, when I was watching the 30 for 30, shout out to ESPN, the, uh, the Sting was on there and he had mentioned like Rick Flair was so good. And here's something that you may not see as much today. Rick Flair wrestled almost every night out of the week, according to him. He and he knew audiences. So he would always scream, yell, wanted you to think he was in pain. And he knew when to do certain things. That's why everyone's like, oh, it's the same Ric Flair match. But he knows when to get people. So out the corner, boom, flip. And then he was having to chop you, sell, chop, sell. Don't sell this one. Mm-hmm. And then Sting would look. And then he would do it again. Don't sell. Don't sell. Then Sting, beat your chest. Ah, and it made Sting look like a monster. A look, monster. And I'll, I'll take your analogy a little further. I always looked at Sting as he turned out to be the Undertaker of WCW. But the way I thought that they wanted him to be was the Ultimate Warrior. But it turns out that Sting was just way better than the Warrior. God rest his soul, not talking ill will of the dead. But in my opinion, is what it is. Sting can run circles around the Ultimate Warrior. So he just kind of separated himself in that regard. You're not wrong. The older, the, sometimes the longer you watch wrestling, you start to see why people did and reacted the way they did for a reason. Right. Most definitely. Most definitely. So Sting ends up becoming world champion in a very gracious and well put together match with Ric Flair. Ric Flair was proud to do it. You always got to show Ric Flair love for not being unwilling to put people over and show love in situations like that. And 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 that's what it was all about. It was all for the betterment of the business. He did like Sting personally, but it was also about business. You know, um, there's some sort of people in his in Ric Flair's life that he wasn't really fond of. But he, if he needed to drop the title and it was right for business, he would do it. He was not ego maniacal in that way, even though <clears throat> ego maniacal in many other ways outside the ring, whatever. The, but when it came to wrestling and the business of it all, Ric Flair had no ego whatsoever. And that's what turned made him end up being one of the greatest of all time. So let's have some fun with this. So when you talk about somebody who has no ego as it relates to the wrestling business, when you talk about somebody who is not going to sit up here and give the powers that be a hard time if it's right for business. Ric Flair had no problem losing a match, okay? So if we know that about him, Conrad, we must then understand that if Ric Flair did have a problem with something, nine times out of ten, it was a legitimate problem. Yeah. So that leads us to what eventually started the process of Ric Flair leaving WCW. And for those who don't know who this man is that I'm about to talk about, please educate the people on Jim Hurd. Uh, I don't know if his resume qualifies for uh, talking about on this, but Jim Hurd is the reason that Ric Flair uh, wanted to leave WCW around this time. Jim Hurd actually wanted to completely change Ric Flair's character. Uh, I believe it was called Spartacus. He wanted him to shave down the bleach blonde hair and wear a Roman helmet on top and put an earring in his ear. Ridiculous. And become a wrestler named Spartacus. It, yeah. Like, looking back on it, it's just, it's it's asinine. Like, what? Yeah, just pure foolishness was going on at the time. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't get why they would want to do something like that. And wrestling was cartoony in the 90s. That's another thing I think people have to understand. Me and Sean were kids, so that they're, they're aiming towards us. But 
I don't think as a kid I would have been interested in that character. I would have said, what is this? Why did you do this? And that's Ric Flair. That doesn't make any sense. And even in our youth, and I'm talking about extreme youth, even us, I mean, I'm thinking, if I'm doing the math right now, five, six, seven, eight years old, not, neither one of us, I believe, even, even as children would have understood why Ric Flair <laughs> was being, let's call it spade a spade, demoted to a position like Spartacus. Like, it makes no sense. He's Ric Flair. And in pro wrestling, you have to remember, these guys are all about themselves. At the end of the day, that's the only person they're negotiating for. It's yeah. about me. What are you going to do with me? Me, 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 me. So I get the frustration from a promoter standpoint, but some of the changes Jim Hurd wanted to make made absolutely no sense. And that was one of WCW's biggest problems. Flair was on the inside, but he really – he controlled like the wrestling aspect of things. Right, the right. management behind WCW really was always a problem because you never knew who was in charge. There were so many different people running certain things and it was always a problem. And I mean, look at what Flair did for that company first. Like going back, we, we've talked time. about all of his great rivalries mm -hmm. going in. He came in as himself. He feuded with the American dream, Dusty Rose, if you will. And he went out there and they put on a great match. It, like I said, the matches were all themed. Common man versus the rich man. You had Ricky Steamboat, the family man versus the, the playboy. Uh, playboy. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you. You had Sting. Sting was just the, the hero versus the anti-hero. Right. This guy's rich, but I'm here and I'm a wrestler and I'm going to show you what I could do. You had the four horsemen. He brought you all of that. He got you to the dance to be talked about with the WWF. Yes, sir. And then you just decided... Nah, let's let's make this man Spartacus. You would have to understand someone's frustration with something like that and just say, like, this is unbelievable. I can't believe that you want to you want to erase images like this. That's part of your company's history, what he's done for you. And then tell me that's like taking who think of the top person in whatever era you like wrestling. Any listener right now, just imagine it. And then you know what? You're going to lose the title. And then we're going to shave your head and we're going to put a Spartan helmet on you and you're going to be Spartacus. That's what they tried to tell Ric Flair. Ridiculous. Um, and again, not to be repetitive, but I think it deserves repeating. Ric Flair was, was zero ego as it pertained to the business side. He was all ego when it came to his personal life, but he was zero ego when it came to – Ric Flair would put you over in a heartbeat if it made sense. Ric, okay. Flair, would, Ric Flair would alter his character, I think, if it made sense. That made no sense. It, it was just like ridiculous. It seemed like career sabotage. That's what it seemed like to me. Yeah, and wrestlers aren't going to go for that. They know. I, I tell people can say all that wins and losses don't matter. Yes, they do. Right. Yes, they do. When you're on top, it definitely matters. There's pe there's people I can tell you now. There are wrestlers that I used to care about, but I've gotten to the point to where I just can no longer invest myself into whatever you're doing because I know how it's going to end. It's ended the same way for the last 15 years. It ain't changing. Sorry, bro. And that's just the way it is with certain people. So I think Ric Flair was right in this situation. I know sometimes people don't want to agree with, oh, the wrestler should just do what he's told. Absolutely not. Because that could end up affecting your paycheck in the long run. Well said. Well said, Conrad. And I think that's very accurate. And I think it's just poignant to what we're talking about. Because like I said, Ric Flair just had no ego when it came to that. So Ric Flair had to do what he had to do. You know, I'm sure Ric Flair wasn't comfortable leaving the horsemen behind. Arn Anderson and him are legitimately best friends. And, you know, it was one of those things where it was like, hey, listen. Uh, and it's funny because uh, Arn just recently came back from WWE. He had had a stint, you know, with Tully. Tully was going to come back, but he a little bit of an issue. We'll talk about that a different day. <laughs> That's always been a big what if for me, man. What if you could have the horsemen with Heenan? Oh, man. Oh, that would have been so cool. But, um, you know, they came back, and it was almost like as soon as they came back, uh, Ric Flair was on his way out, um, which lands him up north to WWE, um, World Wrestling Federation at the time. And uh, this is where things get kicked up a notch. Obviously, Ric Flair's WCW history and lineage will stand the test of time. But I think this small window of 91 through 93 could arguably be – considered two of the greatest years two like a, one of the greatest small blips 
on a career radar that you could ever possibly have. Um, October 1991, after a little bit of a teaser at SummerSlam in August of 81, where, you know, uh, Bobby Heenan is talking about how, you know, the real world champion is coming. I believe it all started on Wrestling Challenge. Always remember Gorilla Monsoons and Jim the Anvil Nyhart's face of shock when he pulls out the WCW belt and says that Ric Flair is on his way. Uh, he further, further teases it at SummerSlam by going to Hogan's door and saying, on behalf of the real world champion, Ric Flair, I'd like to issue a challenge. Hogan slams the door in his face, whatever. But then primetime wrestling, Ric Flair makes his debut. Please just talk to the people, Conrad, about how you felt. I don't know if you saw it live. Did you? Uh, no. Well, maybe I did. I see this is my memory is fuzzy from this point. I was already watching wrestling. Mm -hmm. Like when I was watching it, I knew about Flair coming in and I can vaguely remember like the Undertaker and the casket segments and stuff like that. So around this time is when I was getting into it. So let's do this, bro. We don't have to specifically talk about primetime October 91, but what we can talk about is just the knowledge that he was coming. Tell me how you felt about that. Uh, it was a big deal. It was a big deal at the time because Ric Flair was the WCW cha- Like, this was a dream match. So back in the day, they used to sell magazines. Um, I, I don't know if they were PWI, but all the magazines used to do fantasy matchups. Mm-hmm. What if you had Sting versus the Ultimate Warrior? What if you had Macho, Ma- Macho King Randy Savage versus... Uh, who, who was like the secondary biggest heel back then? Lex I Luger, think, I maybe. Think put, I think like they matched up Savage with um, with Luger. Yeah, like imagine Doom versus Demolition. Right. Like you would just do all these crazy matchups, and if you had the action figures, I used to do the same thing with them. Ric Flair coming over was like the ultimate, bro. We could get Ric Flair versus Hulk Hogan. Do you understand? Who is the better world champion? They were both leaders of their era at the time. It's the early 90s. They're st- they still got their popularity. They can still move. They can still go. And they have the chance to probably make one of the biggest cards of all time if they book these two against each other. That's what I remember feeling from it. Yeah, it was it was cool to think about, even though they screwed it up. Anyway, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> the bottom line is that you had Hogan and Flair now underneath the same roof, which is which is just monumental. <clears throat> the man who was clearly considered the greatest to ever do it in WCW under the same roof with the man who clearly was billed to be the greatest to ever do it in WWE. Honorable mention of Bruno San Martino, but by this time Hogan had surpassed Bruno San Martino in popularity. So it was what it was. Um, I w- I like what WWE did in this regard, which is they teased it a little bit. They didn't want to put him directly with Hogan. We all saw the writing on the wall that WrestleMania 8 should be, could be Hogan and Flair. But what they did was they said, you know what, let's put him in the ring. And I say secondary star, not to be disrespectful, but he was secondary to Hogan. Let's put him in the ring with Roddy Piper. And let's just see how it flows. And I thought it was awesome television from the attack at the broadcast booth to being the sole survivor at Survivor Series. What did you think about that? Yeah, two people who could do this. Mm -hmm. And it made for money television because Piper was on commentary, gave Piper a reason to get back in the ring. Uh, I know he was doing films at the time. So it was a very, very smart thing to do to get uh, Piper back into the mix. But then you also allowed Flair to have a credible opponent that he's familiar with and he has dealt with in his past. Yes, sir. If you didn't know, Piper did do some uh, W. Actually, he was on that Starcade 83 show, I think. He did the uh, dog collar match with Greg the Hammer Valentine. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it just worked, man. It just worked. Those two could just go back and forth, set it up. And I think both people actually came out better off for it. I think if, so. if if that's the situation, see that was like one of those other weird things sometimes with uh, WWE and WCW. Like whichever one you watch, sometimes I felt like in WWE people wouldn't come off good on both sides as much as WCW would. Like those top guys always stayed in those spots because mm-hmm. they knew how to help each other and make each other look good. In right. WWF, sometimes you're like, yo, this might be my last leg drop from Hogan <laughs> and I might be out of here after this. Yeah. But in this situation, I thought both came out on top and I thought Flair brought some of that NWA Flair over with him, if that makes any sense. Like he brought some of the good traits over like, hey, we could both look good in this, man. It, may, it makes all the sense in the world, Conrad. And I think when you think about 
the history of that rivalry. It only lasted a couple months, but it was such it, it, it last left such an impression on the fans' minds. Like I could still for any young fan out there who doesn't know what we're talking about, please Google WWE superstars. Um, you may have to put in WWF superstars depending on you know what the how it was uploaded, but go to YouTube and just look up all you have to do is look up Flair Piper Vince and it'll pop up. Matter of fact, to make it even better, Flair Piper Vince Savage. And I'm telling you, wasn't that the first time Vince got to a physical altercation too? I think so. I yeah. Think so. I mean, yeah. I'm not gonna ruin it for anybody. I really want you guys to go to straight go straight from from this feed after the show and Google that and YouTube that. It was just awesome television. I'll just put, I'll set the stage by saying Ric Flair's coming down the aisle for a squash match, and just sees Piper in his peripheral and. History is made. It was just amazing stuff. Keep in mind, Savage couldn't get involved because he was on probation. It was it was really well done. It was really well done. Um, so it leads to uh, Ric Flair going to Survivor Series to captain. I thought my, uh, I thought the Million Dollar Man was the captain, but it turned out they made Flair the captain of his Survivor Series team, going up against Piper's team. Ric Flair's a sole survivor now. I love Ric Flair. Um, for what he's done in the ring. But you can't, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this when we get to 1994, which is where this installment is going to end um, as it relates to Flair and Hogan. And my very passionate feelings about that, by the way, Conrad. So beware, I'm about to bring heat in a minute. But okay, you bring Flair over and, and you make him the sole survivor at Survivor Series. I guess in a way you have to do that. But where does that leave Piper? I think Piper was on to better things. R WrestleMania 8 was the first podcast I ever reviewed for anybody mm -hmm. listening, like on the Everything Pro Wrestling feed or whatever. Go to, but check the go to EPW, check the archives. Very, very first episode on a crap. I think I did it on my phone, maybe even. Very crappily mic'd up. Wow. Wow. But I absolutely loved talking about WrestleMania 8. It's my first, like, I can remember that entire card and watching it over. And over and mm -hmm. over. So I think they they did put Piper in a, a good position to help younger talent out that he wanted to. Was, that was like Piper's swan song, but that was the way to introduce him with Flair. Mm -hmm. um, it was weird times, though, during that time period, too. I felt like they were trying a lot of things when you look at the card and what was happening. You brought in Flair, but you could do this. You could do that. Let's go in this direction. Let's see what this guy can do. Things that I wish they would do more of today. So, yeah, 91 was a weird year, in my opinion. Ric Flair is a sole survivor of Survivor Series. He ends up moving forward into the Royal Rumble. I still consider this to be the greatest Royal Rumble, not card, not card, but the greatest Royal Rumble match of all time. There will never be a Royal Rumble, in my opinion, outside of possibly, <clears throat> excuse me, outside of possibly Royal Rumble 2002. If you think about who was in that match. But outside of that, I don't think there's any more star power than you can have in the 1992 Royal Rumble. You had the Bulldog. You had DiBiase. You got to do it in your Vince voice if you're going to do it. I got to hear the <laughs> dit, dit. <laughs> what, what? The Vince voice. Don't you remember when they would, when he would introduce the people? For, I remember this as a kid. So all the baby faces and heels uh -huh. were on like the blue and red squares. And then he was like, right. the Berserker. Oh, yeah. Erwin R. Scheister. Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. <laughs> <laughs> Vince had it on lock back then. The Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. The Hardy Bret Hart. <laughs> Haku will be replacing Marty Jannetty. Who <laughs> couldn't be here? Because he ran through the barbershop window. <laughs> oh, my God. You got me crying right now. That's hilarious. I remember it now. That is exactly how it is. I wish we could have the music in the background because it would be great. Oh, my God. Yes, that was – you got me on. That was good. That was good stuff. And the immortal. Like, <laughs> that was great. So, yes, arguably no more, no bigger star power than the 92 Royal Rumble. Hogan, Flair, Justice, Slaughter, DiBiase, Bulldog, HBK. It was Iron just – Sheik. I, that's right, the Iron Sheik as Colonel Mustafa, I believe. Yes, unbelievable. Like it was, 
Um, it was an insane field. Ric Flair wins from the number three position, which was huge, by the way, in the ring. First extended amount of time. Talk about it. Go ahead. He was the first. I be, I, I don't think anyone had won from a single digit number at that point yet. You're teaching I know, me never from single digits. No, that's what made it so insane. Because wow. that's why Bobby Heenan's freaking out on commentary when it happens. And Heenan and Monsoon tonight, this was the most perfect call that you could ever have for a commentary duo of all time. I love them, by the way. I love them, but they were the best to me. Yeah, some some people say it's Jr. and King. Some people, I'll never argue with someone if they say it's yeah. Heenan and Monsoon. I will never argue with you yeah. because they were great. The only thing that dates them is that they had like that, um, uh, who were the two old dudes on the Muppets? Uh, I can't even think of their names right now, but they had that kind of comedy back and okay. forth where it was just yeah. like silly, like, Will you stop it? <laughs> Knock you know, it off, Bobby. You know, you know what the cool part is? I'm going to let you finish your thought. Looking back, it took hindsight as a grown man to figure it out. You can tell just by looking back at that that they loved each other. Yeah, they had way too much fun doing it is yeah. the problem. And and some of the stuff they said is dated, too. When you hear, like, you'll hear, like, political jokes and things like that, that it's like uh, either they'll be inappropriate or things that you'll just be like, wait, what? But it was stuff going on at the time that they're trying to right. reference. Exactly. And – they did an amazing job throughout that Royal Rumble, and they're selling it. And I'll just get to some of my favorite lines real quick of it. Please. The whole, oh, please, I swear I'll never say another bad thing about, about Roddy Piper. Oh, I promise you, Will it's you a kilt. <laughs> he was like, it's a kilt. It's a kilt. I'll never say it's a skirt again. And Flair and him are working together because in the Rumble, back when it was every man for himself, they would actually help each other at certain points in the mm-hmm. match. And then Piper, like two minutes later, pokes him in the eye starts punching off Flair. he's like it's a skirt you stupid idiot it's a skirt and he was just begging saying he wouldn't do it he said i'll never say anything you stop i'll never say anything bad about my mother-in-law again if you can let flair come out of this and win and it was just great great stuff and he starts talking about the ball that was an old storyline but he kept it going everywhere here and then he talked about the boss man's mother and monster would be like you're gonna start again you're gonna start again (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then Bobby Heenan plays innocent. I was just asking a question. <laughs> exactly. Just like a slime ball manager. Oh, my God. Rest in peace to Monsoon and Heenan. They, they, this may sound a little bit over the top, but it, I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Those two brought and still bring, obviously, retrospectively, they bring joy to my heart because they, they were so cool. With it. Like, they had fun. And it, and it, I mean, I you're not supposed to be laughing during a wrestling match, but it was like they made you laugh, and it was like it felt amazing. Like looking back, I just don't. That's the reason why Lawler and and Jr. will never be number one to me, and they were amazing. But I mean, to me, and this is not a Monsoon Heenan podcast, so we'll get back on on track here. But I let's just say I love them. I love them, and they they made me feel things. From a from a com- commentary standpoint, that I had never felt since. That's all I could say. Yeah, J- Jr. and King. To finish my thoughts on it, you would laugh, but it was you were supposed to be laughing at them. <laughs> you were laughing sometimes. It would just be yeah. Jerry just messing with Jr. Because Jim Ross was always the serious like NWA commentator. Like we said, he commentated like most of Ric Flair's career. When you think right. about it, like he facts. came over around the time he did, and it was like, oh man, that's crazy. Facts, facts. So. <clears throat> So Ric Flair wins what I consider, like I said, maybe maybe Royal Rumble 2002, Austin, um, H, you know, Taker, maybe. But I think 92 is the biggest uh, Royal Rumble of all time. And Ric Flair wins it from the number three position. Um, he outlasts Savage. He outlasts Savage, too. Jesus. Outlast Savage. Outlast Sid. Sid. Outlast Hogan. And you just think the right to your point, Conrad. You just think, okay, well, duh. Like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know that Flair would win the Royal Rumble. I thought Hogan would probably win his third straight Royal Rumble. This is me talking as a seven-year-old kid. But either way, somehow this thing's going to come full circle, where you know Hogan and Flair are going to be looking across from each other at WrestleMania eight. And that was the match that was announced. Hogan for some Jack Tunney picks Hogan in the WrestleMania press conference and, and Hogan's the number one contender. And, and you think, okay, the stars have lined up all is right with the world, Hogan and flair, whatever. But here's the problem. And I want you to elaborate on this. I want you to really dig into this. 
WWE back in those days would test the waters with un in untelevised events. They would have future WrestleMania main events, future SummerSlam main events. By that, by that time, SummerSlam was a thing. They would have them face each other in a non-televised match at the Garden or a non-televised match in the Philadelphia Spectrum, you know, just to get a gauge on how the fans would react. And according to what history tells us, Hogan and Flair didn't go over very well in 1992 in live audiences. So, I mean, talk, let's just stop there. What do you feel about that? I don't know. I, I'm calling bullshiggity on that. I just okay. don't believe it. I know that's always been the reason given kind of like they, they tried it out. It didn't draw too well. well like, well, what were you expecting is then my answer. Like, what were you okay. expecting to draw? Mm -hmm. And I think fans were getting smarter around this time. Mm -hmm. Like, you knew, okay, well, this isn't going to be the big match. You're saving this for, for Mania, obviously. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I, I think it comes down to politics with it. A lot of that stuff, anytime I hear Hogan's name, I'm like, there had to be some politics involved in this. Like, okay. But if Flair... I don't know, bro. So hold on. I'm walking through this in my head. Yeah, let's I'm gonna, do it. If you've never heard, heard WrestleMania 8, I'm about to spoil some of it for you. Let's do it. If Flair was going to lose anyway to Savage... And Hogan was going to be Sid. What would have been the difference if you just flip and reverse the matches between those two? Right. You could have did Macho Man versus Sid. That would have been cool. I would have been down with that even. So. But maybe they wanted Elizabeth in there because it fit Flair's personality more. I don't know. It's, I, could, I can't tell if they were trying to do too much or if there was some politics and Hogan was like, listen, Flair's Vince's new favorite thing right now. I'm not facing him because I don't want to lose to him. And it can't happen. They were both big names. So I'm sure, like, if they knocked on Vince's office, he's opening the door saying, hey, I'm all ears. What's going on? Yeah. I got I got time for you. <laughs> so I don't know. I, I just find it. Something else happened that we don't know about, I feel. I'm just well, a I, conspiracy I, I wanna, guy, I, wanna, I guess, I with that. I want to give you some credit, bro. I want to give you some credit because I know what I think happened. And there's historical significance and historical um, knowledge that goes along with what I think happened. I personally think now they say, like you just said accurately, they've been saying for 30 years that the reason Hogan and Flair never happened at Mania because the live crowds during the non televised matches didn't come over as well as they thought. Okay, cool. I think it was simply that they were caught up in the Hogan steroid controversy and they couldn't have Hogan win the belt. And okay, let me take that a step further. And they couldn't have Hogan win the belt, and Hogan probably would not agree to lose to Ric Flair. That's what I think. Interesting. Interesting. So how do you have him come out on top? He Hogan main events. Flair gets the championship. I'll pay them both very well. You know, you can both get that bonus and then that's it. That's how I think it went down. I think Hogan had to take the break because of the steroid controversy. That means that he can't win against Flair. Now, I'm not saying that Flair versus Hogan couldn't have still happened, but is Hogan going to allow Flair to go over on him with his political pull backstage? No. So if Hogan can't win and Flair can't win, then you can't have the match. Man, that might be the theory right there. That's really good because you couldn't have, you want it, you can't, you have to send everybody home happy. That's right. Vince's motto. Mm -hmm. D that did not happen in the NWA for the record. That was, I want people throwing trash in the ring and getting mad at Ric Flair right. as he walks right. out. Right. And, that's smart because Vince thinks you're happy you'll come back and buy another ticket. In the NWA, they're like, oh, they'll come back to buy the ticket to see him lose next time. Exactly. Smart, smart. Yeah, you bring up good points. And the steroid trial is huge. Like, think of the impact that had not even on just this era, but the next, uh, what was it, the new generation era. Oh, yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It, it's changed everything. huge. It changed everything. That by, the time, by the time Hogan and or Vince felt comfortable, but – by the time Hogan felt comfortable coming back and or Vince felt comfortable bringing him back, the, the landscape had changed. That year that Hogan took off from eight to nine, bro, think about that. Think about that year, those next 12 months from eight to nine. Uh, Bret Hart showed who what he can do in the main event situation against the Bulldog, which le led him to beating Flair in Saskatoon. Shawn Michaels came on the scene, won the Intercontinental belt, faced Brett 
title for title, not title for title, but for the WWE title at Survivor Series. Sean came up and took that spot from Bulldog because and Bulldog was getting the big push too. But I think if that scandal never happened, I think Bulldog would have been in the position Sean was in. There you I go. think it would have been flipped. There you go. But so by the time Hogan swings back around, now we all know that we he appeased him. At, you know, the WWE appeased Hogan at WrestleMania 9 in the most controversial crap you could ever imagine. I'm not going to talk about that because I'll be talking about that for hours, how mad, how mad it makes me now. But by the time Hogan swings back around, the landscape has changed. Everything has changed. Now, there's still big men in prominent positions, i.e. Yokozuna. But Yokozuna and Hogan are not on the same level. And what I mean by that, that's, I'm talking about that's a compliment to Yokozuna is what I'm trying to say. Meaning Yokozuna is not on Hogan's level, meaning he was better than Hogan in that moment. Yoko being WWE champion as a 505-pound sumo wrestler, I thought was more appealing than Hogan, red and yellow, putting his hand to his ear after being off for a year. And, and, and this is actually going to come into play towards the end of our discussion here. Remember what we just said about Hogan? Hogan was played out by this time in the WWF, I would say. In 93, it was over. And, and, and even at this rumble we're talking about where Flair wins the championship, it was very like noticeable that Hogan got dumped out. And then he was mad. Like, why are you complaining? It's every man for himself. And then he grabs Sid and... I mean, I'm sure Rick's happy about it because he got to win the title. I'm gonna give standpoint. you something. I'm gonna give you something, and all of our viewers something, some homework. Maybe you've already done this homework. I probably shouldn't assume you haven't done it because you're usually on top of your game. But just in case, watch the Royal Rumble 1992 when Hogan gets eliminated, and then Hogan is having his temper tantrum. And the fans are booing Hogan. Then, then watch the following Saturday night's main event. And there's a segment in the February 1992 edition of the Saturday night's main event. Follow me now. Where they replay what happened at the end of the Royal Rumble. They literally, my brother, changed the crowd reaction to them cheering for Hogan instead of booing. Do you know what I'm talking about? 100%. The original version, Hulk Hogan is booed in, I believe it was Syracuse where that happened, the, yeah. that rumble. Yes. That he, he is booed out of that arena like nobody because he cheated, bro. You <laughs> grab somebody who is still in the match. You can't be yes. mad that Sid dumped you yes. and then Flair wins because of that. Whatever. So that leads to problems between them. Right. But Hogan was not the fan favorite that everybody thought he was at the time. WWE likes to do what I like to call uh crowd sweetening, we'll just say. Mm-hmm. Ah, how do I want you to say I want you to cheer? And it's worked in the past. We can't front like it didn't. Like yeah. The Goldberg chants weren't even real when they first started. They were pumping those in. And then people started doing it, though, because they thought everyone else was. So. Right, right. But, yep, they changed it, bro. So I, I, I told you, I never insult your intelligence. You're a smart guy. You probably, I knew you knew. They changed on the Saturday night's main event recap of the 92 Royal Rumble. They literally changed the crowd reaction with voiceover. It was insane. Insane. Now, seven-year-old Sean Eight-year-old Conrad, maybe we didn't pick up on that. But grown man Sean and grown man Conrad picked up on that. Real quick. <laughs> Real quick. <laughs> but anyway, let's get, back, let's get back to what we're talking about. Instead of the hypocrisy that was WWE in 1992. <laughs> so let, let me say this. So yeah. do you think this is where Flair's problems began around WrestleMania 8 with the company? There was a strict, so everything was real strict at the time. You had to follow all the rules Vince was telling you. Mm -hmm. Flair probably liked that there was one boss, but with one boss, that's the end all be all. That's Mm -hmm. it. When he says it, it's over. Like there's no conversation with it. No blading at the time. And in two of those WrestleMania eight matches, blading happened. Mm -hmm. Um, And during it, Bret Hart got some color in his match. He he cut his forehead, but Bret's was so slick, nobody noticed how he did it. It was smooth. 
Rick Flair's was so obvious that Vince went crazy. I believe it was on the spot where Macho Man does the double axe handle smash exactly. onto the uh, guardrail. Flair busts his head open. He's bleeding. It makes for a great moment right. and a great promo after for the record. Fast. And because uh, we always talk about the 92 uh, Rumble, that promo, great. But no one talks about the WrestleMania 8 one enough, I feel. I agree. And after that, he loses the championship. But he's, he seems like he's in limbo after this kind of. He's, there's a lot of games, and there's a storyline that takes place not too long after with Flair and who's going to be the champion between Warrior and uh, Go right into Savage. it. Go right into it, man. Yeah, SummerSlam 92, Warrior, Savage. And I love I love some of the worst storylines that people like love to talk about. Like I like when WWF used to do those whose side am I on type of storylines. Like I loved Lex Luger and Tatanka storylines. Some people hate it. Absolutely. I, I loved it. I enjoyed it. And I was fooled too. Yeah. I was really fooled at the end. I was like, Tatanka, how could you? Yeah. <laughs> so, and I felt the same way with this one. This one was really smart. Like, oh, is, uh, is Warrior the bad guy or is Savage going back to being right. bad because he wants to get Warrior back? And I kept sitting there right. thinking, and it turned out he was lying to both of them because him and Perfect are just evil doers like that. And it, it worked out pretty well, but Flair then kind of got put into this weird, like, yeah, you're in the main event, but you're not really in the main event. Right. And eventually he would become champion. I think he beat Savage on, was it Superstars? Yeah, he beat Savage on, I think it was a replay on Superstars. It was a live event, and they recapped it on Superstars and showed the highlights. And then they did this really cool um, celebration where he, Heenan, and Ramon are drinking champagne in the locker room. It was cool. I liked it. And, and they introduced us to Razor Ramon, one of the yes. coolest characters of all time. And I like that that little trio they had there with Perfect, Flair, and Ramon, and Heenan. I loved it. Just it just worked. I loved it. And I wish it would have lasted longer, but we all know what happened before Survivor Series 92 um, with Warrior. But that's another story for another day. So Ric Flair ends up winning. Thank you for that segue, bro, because Ric Flair ends up winning a title back after the manipulation of Warrior and Savage uh, with Ramon's help and with Perfect's help and with Bobby Heenan's tutelage. And then... He loses the, the title to Bret Hart, okay, uh, which, like we talked about earlier, was the turning point in WWE, which is why when Hogan came back, the landscaper changed. But little did we know that that title would be the last championship Ric Flair would win in WWE for many years, won the IC title over a decade later. But my point I'm trying to make is Ric Flair was about to leave again. And it was like, whoa, like, we didn't know it in October. We didn't know it even in – Gen well, we did know it by January because at that point, they're starting to promote by the 93 Royal Rumble that tomorrow night on Raw, this is when Raw became uh, a thing, Ric Flair and Mr. Perfect are going to be wrestling each other in a career match, in a, win in a loser leaves WWF match. What? Yeah, that was crazy. Like, think about that. From November to January, in two months, Perfect has now left him as the manager, went against him. Razor Ramon's not even a factor. In not even a thing anymore. anymore. Exactly. And, and I believe at that time, they were already gathering the plans to make Waltman like the baby face. Like, they had already knew, like, oh, we got this kid coming in from right. Global. Bruce Bruce recommended him probably, and they, they say all this good stuff about him. That's and, right, brother. That's right. Yeah, they were already like, yeah, Razor Ramon's going to be a big baby face for us. And it just happened. And I just remember seeing that perfect plex in the red attire playing Royal Rumble on Sega Genesis, baby. Oh, Done. Yeah. Mr. Perfect gets the W, and it was just over. Actually, that might have been Super Nintendo with per uh, Mr. Perfect in it. That's how – and Flair, yeah, because I don't think he was in the Sega version. But neither here nor there. I'm a nerd. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's – yeah. And that's what ends up happening. So Flair's out. And I just, I never understood the backstory of why or how, but it that that's where the chips fell, I guess. It was. And, and it was one of those things where you just realize, okay, well, this is business, I guess. And Flair's leaving. And then I, I think even nine-year-old Sean, you know, 10-year-old Conrad, whatever we were at the time, I think we knew that he would eventually go back to probably six-year-old Sean, seven-year-old Conrad, knew that he was going back to WCW. I think we picked up, even though it was a loser leave, w, it was like, even at that age, like young, but still kind of, I think we were like, okay, he's probably going back to WCW. Right. You know, so he eventually goes back to WCW at um, at Super Bowl on the commentary level. Um, he, he watches Barry Windham 
win the WCW title, which eventually leads to, I'm going to kind of skim over this because I really want to get to some, unless you got something, talk about it. All I want to say is great match with great Muda. Absolutely love those two. Ric Flair always had high praise for Barry Windham, so I thought it was always special that he was there for that. Because okay. Barry Windham got robbed of his moment a bunch of times where it was like, yeah, we'll have uh, Flair lose to Windham, which was the original plan when the Spartacus thing started to come up, like, oh, you'll put over Barry Windham, but it never got to happen because they changed it. All right, we're putting the belt on Luger. Luger and Sting's a new rivalry, and Barry's kind of just like, well, what happened to me? So... It, one of those sad situations. Thank you for t- cutting me off. I needed to be cut off. That was a really good nugget you just gave. Wow. I didn't even know that. Yep. Whoa, that's strong, bro. That's that's why you're the man. Anyway, um, EBW every Wednesday night. Just, you know, anyway. <laughs> um, yeah, man. So he wins the title back from Wyndham. Goes into this really cool uh, storyline with, um, with Rick Rude. Loses the title, wins it back. But here's... I know I feel like I'm skimming over stuff, but but I, I'm we're about to wrap this thing up. But I'm not wrapping it up with a, without a lot of emotion here, bro. Because you know, I I'm pissed. Looking oh, back on this thing, I'm pissed. But go ahead. Let me explain one more thing for why Flair wasn't wrestling for most of '93. Mm-hmm. Ric Flair still had a. I guess a contractual obligation. There really weren't contracts back then. Mm -hmm. Like Vince only promised you probably like a thousand dollars guaranteed. Right. But back then he signed a no compete because he let flair go earlier than he needed to. So flair couldn't wrestle and he, so he could be on television, but he could not do anything in a wrestling capacity for one year. That's why Flair for the gold was made. That's why everything happened the way it did. But continue. I just wanted to make sure people understood why he couldn't do anything. <laughs> I had I did not. That's amazing information. I did not know that. Yeah, I'm full of it. Useless, useless info all up here for pro oh, wrestling. Was, I got it, baby. That was freaking awesome. I didn't know that. And that's a no. That makes sense though. Wow. All right. There you go. There you go. So Flair comes back. Like we talked about earlier, some of his most notable championships were as a baby face. He beats um, Vader in a career match to retain, to win back the WCW belt. They go through this little phase where WCW International, a fictitious organization we know now later. I know. Yeah. It was a fictitious organization that we now know later because they had two belts, whatever. Little back and forth with Ravishing Rick Rude, another back and forth with Sting. I really want to jump into this. I want to talk about Hogan's arrival to WCW, and that's where we're going to leave off this edition of Hubbard Wrestling Weekly Everything Pro Wrestling Collabo and set the stage for part two, which will be airing live on Monday, July 20. Fifth. Hogan's coming to WCW. All right. Hogan's <laughs> had these issues. <laughs> I can I can hear that. I can hear that crappy <laughs> WCW music already. <laughs> Hogan's left WWE after he reneged on his deal he made with Bret Hart. He lost the title of Yokozuna. He's been off for a year. Here Thunder comes Hogan. In Thunder in paradise, dude. <laughs> After the blunder in paradise fiasco, blunder in paradise, uh, and here he comes. And Hogan, he, this ticker tape parade in in, in Mickey Mountain and, and Disney World, and the big announcement. He signs the fake contract, which he already signed in private, and they do the fake, you know, the, the fake press conference with him and Flair. And now, once again, ten-year-old Sean or eight-year-old Sean, nine-year-old Conrad. I'm sure we both were very excited to see that Flair and Hogan were going to face each other because this would be the first time at Bash in the Beach 1994 that Hogan and Flair would face each other on television. I'm going to skip to the end. Hogan wins. But here's my issue. WCW, and I and I want you to take your sweet time on this because this is going to be the last segment of part one, EPW, HWW, Ric Flair Rep- Retrospective. I want you to really dig in. Don't shortchange me, bro. 
don't I want everything from you on this. All right. All right. WCW had always made it clear that Ric Flair was the best in the world. And Jim Ross, back when he was still in WCW, would always, and he, there's a quote, he said, Ric Flair is the most talented wrestler here, meaning WCW, or in any federation. How much more transparent can you get? That's a quote from Jim Ross. Ric Flair is the best wrestler in the world here or in any federation. For the younger fans, the world WWE used to be called the World Wrestling Federation. So you fast forward to Hogan making his debut in WCW. The biggest match of all time. I'm not going to take anything away from that. Flair Hogan 94 is the greatest match, biggest match of all time at that point. No argument there. How the hell do you have Ric Flair, the man that has been the flagship of your company for 15 years, lose to the man who has been compared to him for 15 years that you said could not hold a candle to Ric Flair? I'm going to let you take it from here. I am actually looking up one research fact to make sure that I've got this right. Okay. Maybe you know. When did Eric Bischoff take over WCW? I believe Bischoff took off took over in 93. I have no shame in looking that up. Let me look that up right now. I, I, I'm trying to double check myself too because I know eventually he takes over in around that time. He in let me see here. So in 94, he was promoted from executive producer to senior vice president, putting him in charge of everything for uh, WCW. Now, okay, so I, guess, he, I guess 94 is when he came into his power as we know it. So he was already here, and he was happy with the signing, it feels like. And there's a lot to like about Eric Bischoff. There's a lot not to like sometimes with Eric Bischoff. And I think in this role in the beginning, Eric Bischoff was still learning like what to do, how he was going to do it, and everything else. And I think he saw the opportunity to where he had Hogan and he said, well, what's the best use of Hogan? You have to entice this dude. Hogan's going to get what Hogan's going to get. Yeah, He's, he's going to say, I want the t-shirt deal. Okay. I wonder, some people, they said that he didn't even have a WCW contract. Some people said he had a Turner contract Oh, so that he, he made sure he was getting his money. Wow, and I know other people ended up doing that later on too. If they thought they were big stars, they're like, "I need that Turner contract, not the WCW. I'll pay you two hundred dollars a night, guaranteed." Right, right, right. <laughs> nah, nah, nah. Mm -hmm. So they went in with this, and to me, it felt like they tried to recreate WrestleManias and mixed everything like together. Right. Anything that was good about Hogan showed up there. Like, uh, who, who was involved in all this match outside people? Sean? Oh, you want to, I could give you the rundown of the celebrity list from that night. Uh, yeah. Hank Aaron, the all time home run leader for many years. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal, Orlando, that made sense. Mr. T, Nick Bachwick was, was announced as a new commissioner. Antonio Inoki was there. Many people were there. Th that's what I'm saying. All those names you mentioned, doesn't this feel like a rehash of like Mr. T, WrestleMania one? Mm -hmm. Um, did you say Muhammad Ali too? Muhammad Ali was not there, but Muhammad Ali would do business with WCW. But that night, Hank Aaron, the home run king, was there. Well, who was the referee for this contest? Was it Mr. T? No, there was no special re re referee for, for Hogan, oh, Flair, Bash at the Beach. Okay, so he was just hanging with them. See, but, I'm trying to remember this. But, but, to give, but to give you some credit and context, I know what you're talking about. Mr. T was the special referee when they faced each other in Halloween Havoc. Thank you. So it, it blurs sometimes together with some of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And once they started putting all this together, it just felt so WWE-esque. That's why it didn't work for me. It felt like WCW kept going away from what made them different, and now they were becoming more like WWE. If continue. That makes sense. continue. Does, I just want to continue just real quick, a little nugget to your point. Bash at the Beach 94 was the biggest event in the history of the company at that time. Facts. 
and that they had all eyes on them. So I don't blame Eric Bischoff for doing what he did. I think if we were in that situation at that time, not knowing what we know now, we might have done the same thing. We might have said, you know what? Let's let's put it like this and let's do this. But as a from a fa- I'm t- that's business perspective. From a fan perspective, I'm coming in and I'm telling you, Ric Flair was the end all be all, and it seems very weird that you didn't go with Flair. And if you're going to continue this feud for months and months and months, why not put Flair over so that he looks credible? Conrad, ex- excuse my tone because I know we're actually on the same page here. This is more for anybody who may be disagreeing with with us watching this wonderful show that we put together. How can you sit up here and say that the man that you had this company ride on on his back for a decade and a half and was better than the guy that WWE was riding on his back, this guy comes here. He comes to your backyard and beats your guy. You know what that means? That means WWE is better than WCW. In the fans, in the fans' mind, instantly. And, and I kind of had those thoughts back then, even. And and like I said, I'll be honest with everybody. I was always more of a WWF kid, but like I grew up in New York, though. Yeah, I, not, I, it, it would be different for someone in Georgia, probably. Like, no, nah, I'm a WCW guy. So, but, look, but looking back on it as grown men who have some sense, and see, this is the thing that pisses me off, bro. We're looking back at this as mid 30s gentlemen looking back on our youth, right? Eric Bischoff's a grown man at well, this time. But th- here's the thing, though. I think he had just taken over before this, though. So think, you're brand new in the company. Eric's back's against the wall. He's He just got promoted to this position that was held previously by Bill Watts. Everybody right. hated him. Right. And Bill Watts, I, rumor has it, he purposely got fired so that they'd have to pay him all that money. So that's why he was saying all the foolishness and doing everything he was. Yeah. So Bischoff's now in charge. So now he's like, listen, my only goal is to make sure that this company becomes profitable. We have not been profitable in years. So I want to do that so that way I look like I can stay on top and I can keep this position. Okay, what are you going to do, Eric? Well, what if I got this? Okay, we you got Hogan. You brought Hogan in. And this is only when they still had Saturday night, and they're still only doing those Disney tapings. And they're trying to make some moves here and start like, running some bigger buildings. Wide and, yeah. Yeah, so they're trying to set up like Hogan is going to be a very important part of this. But Hogan and, doesn't have to I'm, – I'm, I'm not going to cut you off. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I, I'm going to wrap up this point soon. So Bischoff's back's against the wall, but he has to get – Hogan's like, what are you going to give me? Why do I need to come over there? I'm filming Thunder in Paradise, brother. I've got offers coming in, dude. Like, what are you going to give me so that I can do whatever I got, Jack? Like, that's that's all this dude wanted to get in there and do. And he – basically what I'm saying is Hogan had all the leverage in the world. WCW had no leverage. You need me more than I need you, so what are you going to give me? Can I have creative control? Because I had it before. Okay. You know what I mean? They're signing everything over to him. Like, okay, how much do you want for your merch? I used to get 12. Can I get 14? Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. No problem. Oh, I used to. And I'm making up figures. These aren't no, no, I got you, I got any of them. But I just want to say that for the audience, just in case they're like looking it up like, you're a liar. <laughs> but he, he, probably, he probably got more than that. Fictitious numbers just to prove a point. Yeah. So Hogan could tell Bischoff whatever he wanted. So at that point, Bischoff stuck between a rock and a hard place. Like, what is what is he supposed to do? He's going to have to give him whatever he wants. You think Hogan's coming in like, yeah, let me take that loss. No, 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 brother. It hasn't been working with him, dude. So I got to drop that leg drop one time, 15 feet high, brother. He won't even see it coming. We'll make business and we'll make it look good. And Flair's unselfish. So Flair's just like, yeah, whatever makes the company better. Yeah, because that's who he was. So it, I think it was just a storm, bro. And the storm was just perfect. H- Hogan needed to win. Because wins and losses matter in pro wrestling. Don't let anyone tell you differently. Bischoff needed to look good and flair. So they try. What's the best way you can make a win-win-win-win situation for all parties involved? Everybody won. All the celebrities got paid. Hogan's friends got paid. Hogan's friends all had jobs later. And bringing Hogan in once again. This goes back to the Cody Rhodes thing in modern day wrestling. You have to treat that guy right because. He's got keys that open doors to other things you're going to need later. Mm. 
Bischoff wants to get rid of, uh, I don't remember if it was Bunkhouse Buck or whoever was around at the time. But if you're trying to move on from those characters and doing what they do, you want Hacksaw Jim Duggan, you need Hogan. That's a fact. It's a good point. Wow. Wow. Um, I'm going to say this and I'm going to let you take us home. Keep in mind, everybody, once again, that on uh, Monday, July 20, I keep messing up the date. There's no shame. I'm going to look up. I'm not going to get it wrong. I don't care. <laughs> Monday, I keep messing up. July 25th, uh, we're going to be live, 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 live with part two of this Ric Rick Flair retrospective as we get ready for July 31st and Ric Flair's final match exclusively on Fight TV. Um, I mean, we, we've dug into so many things, you know, and this is only the first half of this, bro. Like, I guess just to put a stamp on it, this was really fun, you know, and for me, it's just obviously Ric Flair's contributions to the business are priceless. We're going to get into a little bit more detail about his outside the ring, not too much, but a little bit of his outside the ring stuff next time, as well as his uh, the conclusion of his second WCW run, uh, as well as his last and final WWE run, maybe a little bit of TNA as well. And it's all going to lead up to what we're going to be talking about, which is July 31st, exclusively on Fight TV, 14 years after what we thought was his final match. But we will really see his final match as Jim Crockett Promotions. I want to make sure we throw that out there. JCP, JCP, Jim Crockett Promotions. The yes, the same legendary Jim Crockett Promotions that we remember, remember from the late 1980s is presenting Ric Flair's final match exclusively on Fight TV. Listen, brother, take us home. Get our appetites ready for part two, and uh, let's go from there, man. The, the, the floor is yours. Take us home, brother. Yeah, listen, we had a blast talking about uh, Ric Flair, giving you kind of a career retrospective for him. One, for probably memories, and two, probably for just the the opportunity to, to relive. Like, sometimes it's just fun to go back. Like we said, that was our childhoods. For some people, it might be educational. And I hope you you learned maybe a few nuggets of information that you're like, yo, I never knew that about uh, the past stuff going on with Ric Flair. So Ric Flair's last match, you guys are going to be able to watch that uh, coming up with that SummerSlam weekend. If you're big wrestling fans, I would highly recommend going to Fight, checking it out, getting that order for it. But uh, we're going to be back with part two, and I think it's going to be fun to talk about the later half of the career. Like, just think, we talked about a lot right there. We haven't even gotten into anything from like 94 all the way until 2008. We could go to wow. 12. We could go to today. Wow. wow. There's a lot more to cover when it comes to uh, Nature Boy Ric Flair's career. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Take us home, man. Take us home. So listen, for myself and my partner, my tag team partner who gave me some hot tags in this, I'm going to give him, I'm going to raise his arm up and point to him right here to my man. Hubbard Wrestling Weekly, Sean Hubbard, uh, I appreciate you for inviting me on to do this. It was great. And, uh, yeah, I love the tag team effort, and I think you're going to be seeing some more from us in the future. So thank you for having me on, and make sure you guys come back next week to check us out when we are live. Live. In the Ric Flair last match. Everyday pro wrestling, they can never be you. Listen to the podcast for the people. The best show that's here, so listen in. Let the knowledge begin. The opinions, the lesson, yes. For the fans, uh, for the fans, uh. Not many in this can understand, uh. This the podcast to show you who I am, uh. Conrad Cushman, the legend in the plans, uh. Please listen every day to the showcase. The opinions and knowledge that anyone can take. Showing you how it is done. Proving I am number one. What a legend becomes. This is now my time to show you that I am here. Uh. This podcast just to make it loud and clear. Uh. By the fans, uh. For the fans, uh. Not many whose hand can understand uh. everything pro wrestling. They can never be you. Listen to the podcast here for the people. The best show that's here. So listen in. Let the knowledge begin. The opinion and the lesson. Yes. Everyday pro wrestling. They can never be you. Listen to the podcast for the people. The best show that's here. So listen in. Let the knowledge begin. The opinions. The lesson. Yes.